My seizures occur every 14 days or so. I don't actually know what the seizure itself feels like since I'm unconscious, but prior to having a seizure, it was almost like a hallucination in which I heard a man's voice saying, I'm going to come get you. Livia Amita suffers from epilepsy, an electrical disorder in the brain that causes seizures and has afflicted people from Roman Emperor Caligula all the way to Danny Glover. Livia, however, is about to fight electricity with electricity as her neurosurgeon implants 14 electrodes deep into her brain in order to investigate the part where the seizures originate. All right, let's drive to the first site. Her brain surgeon is Stanford neuroscientist Casey Halpern. Like, in terms of, like, the overall complexity of the brain, how much does neuroscience know? Do you have, like, an estimate the way, like, astronomers are like, oh, yeah, there's, like, 98% of the galaxy that we don't, we just don't know? I think it's a, a, a reasonable analogy. There is so much we don't know. But what we do know, we know quite well. You do have to think about brain function as being due to where one part of the brain is connected to the other. It's all a big circuit. It's all a big circuit. And Livia's brain is now even more of a circuit, which allows Dr. Halpern's team to map the brain's functions by trying out the different connections. What we're trying to do now primarily is to figure out brain function by inactivating a specific area of the brain by passing electricity through it. By passing an electrical current between two of the electrodes, the doctors can hopefully figure out what the part in between does or doesn't. All right, our POA one, two, or three. Did you feel anything unusual with that one? I feel like I was lifted a little bit. <laughs> Five and six. When we did that one, it made me feel a little bit nervous. <laughs> really? Uh-huh. Okay. I want you to stare right at the dot. Tell me if anything changes, okay? Uh-huh. What's happening? A rainbow dot showed up in the upper left-hand corner. Great. Let's go RPOI 6-7. Now uh, the sparkles were more just right to the left of the dot. Can you count down from 10? Go on. 10, 9... Oh yeah, wait, seven, six, four. What happened? Were you trying to talk? Uh-huh, at least I think I was still trying to go down the numbers. So you knew what you wanted to say? Uh-huh. But you just couldn't do it? Uh-huh. Okay. Cyborg. <laughs> in order to make the brain work better, first you have to look under the hood and learn how the brain works in the first place. Unfortunately, human beings are a little squeamish historically when it comes to you know, cracking open your cranial cavity. So it's been left to neuroscientists to do their brain research on subjects who are a little more willing. They're less willing than unable to get away. Due to some similarities between their brains and humans, Dr. Halpern and his team have been using mice as their research subjects, trying to map out the neural networks responsible for different sorts of behavior. We can inform larger leaps in science or translations to medical care, changing the way we treat patients and brain disorders at least in the context of an area of interest of mine, uh, which is in trying to control um, impulses. This experiment's target impulse is binge eating. We tried to provoke their binge by giving them a high-fat pellet. It tastes like butter. <laughs> I swear to God, I thought he was wearing like a tiny Burger King crown for a second. Well, that is the pin on the top of the electrode that we connect the wires to yeah. so that we can actually uh, stimulate the area of the brain that we know can lead to attenuation of binge eating. Just like plugging in a pair of speakers. If a mouse or a human is anticipating a food reward, we know that right before that patient gets the food reward, the nucleus accumbens will light up. You can liken that to alcoholism, about to take a swig. You can liken that to meeting up with your drug dealer right before you pay the drug dealer. And so if we can target that activity, maybe we can alter that decision by blocking the impulse. Go ahead. Something to put it in. And then remotely, we can monitor the brain waves and actually intervene in real time. You're smelling it. Physically, what's the therapy? It's just a minor shock, or is it, it, it is definitely not a shock, Sorry. though I would understand why you would think that. It is a low dose delivery of electrical stimulation. He's still eating. And the stimulation just got triggered. Whoa, okay, yeah. So now he doesn't want to eat it. The binge gets interrupted, so it'll stop binge eating. But it won't start behaving in a strange, adverse way. It doesn't make the mouse freeze or anything like that. Seized, it just yeah. seems to make the mouse a little less interested in binge eating. Okay. We have all these episodic conditions, impulses that drive behavior that can be dangerous. An impulse to 
binge eat or commit suicide or uh, take advantage of a coworker sexually. Uh, these are impulses that we don't need. If we can actually control these problems, perhaps in the most severe of cases with surgery, um, we should be able to have a major impact on our society. While Dr. Halpern works to reprogram the way mice think in hopes of changing impulsive people's behavior, in Pittsburgh, another team of neuroscientists, led by Dr. Aaron Batista, has hooked a different animal's brain directly into a computer using a brain-computer interface, or BCI. BCI is basically a bunch of electrodes that are surgically implanted into the brain and then plug into an outside device. It's like an adapter for neural to digital information. So this is the multi-electrode array. This little part is what's implanted in the brain. This has 100 electrodes on it, and this is the part that tunnels out of the skull onto this connector, and then that's the side that allows us to connect to the neurons. Yeah. It's really an amazing technology. Can you explain the experiment to me? The main focus of the lab is to understand basic sensory motor control and cognition, because if we're gonna build systems that can restore that, we need to know what the target is. So in that spirit, we use a brain-computer interface system to do our basic science research in normal, healthy, intact monkeys. Today's monkey is Earl, one of six non-human primates taking part in Dr. Batista's experiment. How similar to human brains are rhesus monkey brains? In terms of rudimentary sensory motor coordination, the type of stuff we need to understand, they've got what we've got. That's Earl thinking? That's the neurons firing? Each small rectangle is a different neuron. The electrode array in Earl's BCI has been wired to a group of neurons associated with the motor function of his right arm. All right, everyone ready? Earl's limbs have been gently restrained for the course of the experiment, so it's purely his thoughts moving the dot to its target. How do you teach him not to go outside the lines? Everything we use is positive reinforcement. Uh -huh. So when he does the task correctly, he'll get a reward. What is his reward? Is it just a clicking sound? Or? No, he's getting a liquid reward. For the monkey, they have a lot of dexterity, but you're limited by their cognitive understanding of what we need them to do. Right. So we're never going to get a monkey to type out a text message. Because, However, yeah. there's a lot that can be developed here that can facilitate how those devices perform in people. While Earl can't use his VCI to text, back at Stanford, Dr. Jamie Henderson has been working with a subject who can not only text with his BCI, he can buy things on Amazon and leave a review because he is a human being. The entire purpose of the type of work that we're doing, the brain-computer interface, is to try to get intention out of the brain in order to use it to do something useful in the outside world. I was a mechanical engineer. I spent most of my life building machinery. And it's always been a joke. I loved machinery so much that someday I would become one. So right now, I am just typing with thoughts. Before he could type with his mind, Dennis DeGray was a volunteer firefighter who became quadriplegic in 2007 after taking a nasty spill. Dr. Henderson implanted Dennis's BCI in 2016, and he's been experimenting with it ever since. Dumb question of all dumb questions. What does it do? It acts more or less as a hearing aid, listening to the very basic activities of my brain. Are you thinking of moving the cursor itself, or are you thinking of using a mouse? The visualization I found most comfortable for me was imagining a pool ball on a table mm -hmm. with my hand on top of the pool ball. You roll away, it goes up, you pull back, it goes down, it left, right accordingly. Like a trackball. Like the old tabletop video games. Yeah. How do you think click? Is that, does it? I imagine snapping the fingers on my left hand. Okay. And so it's a nice abrupt movement and the system can pick it up out of the, uh, the rest of the background noise very clearly. How do you separate what you're making the computer do from thinking about things you're hearing? Thinking and typing would be equivalent to you riding your bicycle and thinking about what you're gonna do at the office today. Right. I mean, the two don't really cancel each other out. They're just, uh, you know, not necessarily connected. What I'm doing now is beyond my wildest dreams from when I started. Sometimes I'm surprised, sometimes I'm overwhelmed, I'm frequently frustrated, but 
This is still research and we are still learning. I believe every week we are making uh, significant scientific breakthroughs. While the medical world is blurring the lines between mind and machine in order to help restore their patients' abilities, military researchers are using similar technology for, unsurprisingly, military purposes. I'm at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, um, having an electrode attached to my head and arm so that I can um, accentuate my focus by electricity. Low-level electricity. Wright-Patterson houses the Air Force Research Lab's Applied Neuroscience Branch. Instead of working on technology that enhances an airplane or the computational systems that the airmen use, we're taking a different approach in that you know, we're seeing what we can do to actually enhance the airmen themselves. While this approach is nothing new to the Air Force, instead of giving pilots extremely strong stimulants, Dr. McKinley's team is using transcranial direct current stimulation, which is simply where you put electrodes on either side of the brain and run a current from one to the other to amplify the parts of the brain it's zapping through. The distractions are much less, and I can kind of zone in on each individual category instead of being overwhelmed. Whenever you're ready, just hit start experiment. Oh, shoot. Not great at this. Mmm, not amazing. So once we turn it on, the typical sensations are a tingly sensation. Okay. So basically you're gonna do the same thing again, and then we'll see what happens, so go ahead. I feel a lot more into this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Your score is down here. That's first time. That's uh, second time. I cleaned up a little. Yeah. 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 It sort of feels like I kind of bypassed the the drinking of coffee and put it just straight up in into my noodle. And while the Air Force is stimulating the brains of what they call their war fighters, the highly secretive Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or DARPA, is developing tools to read the brain on a level ten thousand times more detailed than current technology allows. How hard is the military angle or the military application as far as a rule for, for DARPA projects? It's required. I right. mean, yeah, that's what DARPA is about, right? And so we're, we're about the warfighter and making sure that we don't have any sort of military surprise. So we're out there looking at some of the most revolutionary technologies to make sure that we understand what they are, how they're going to work, what would be military relevance. And having folks and labs in the United States that are well-versed in building these technologies is all, is all good for the military. Do you foresee a manner in which kind of the work you're doing could be used to enhance human thought or like, I guess, like more of a supplement than a medicine? Enhancement is not necessarily a bad thing. We could improve behavior, but we certainly don't want these kinds of interventions to be abused. However, if it can be abused, that means it's effective. Right. So that's a problem I'm happy to help fight when it presents itself. To me, the, the BCI opportunities for the future are huge. Yeah. I, I really see it as, as a disruptive technology, but we need to do it very um, ethically, right, legally, right. and make sure we understand the social implications of this. Because you can do a lot of damage in there. Absolutely. 